All right, now I got a uh, another short and sweet video, a lot like on Chessable. Um, today uh, I'm going to be looking at a, a game that I played, another Blitz game, and I got I think the current rating on this account is like 2497 or something like that. So getting pretty close to the 2500 marker again. And I was playing an opponent who's in the mid 2400s. And he used a specific move order that I don't think is too hot. And actually, something that I've been doing in my time right now uh, to prep my students for nationals, I think Chessable is such a wonderful program. I went ahead and put all of their repertoires on Lee Chess in Chessable and improved them and made them trainable variations. So I've got like 15 books in, in Chessable that are now in, in progress. So uh, I'm really excited to see them improve the course over time and make it better and better. And uh, for us to have some great games at Nationals this year. So we got two months to a base, well, a month and a half to work with these repertoires, and I'm really excited to see how it pans out. Because um, to me, the most satisfying thing is seeing uh, the preparation that you work so hard on like manifest itself on the board. So that's always a solid thing. And uh, this actually came out of my analysis with one of their repertoires. Um, the idea that I used in this game. So 1d4, 1c5, and there's lots of ways to play here, and I've got a couple of 1c5 players on the team. Um, we got one playing the Ben Noni. <laughs> ben. And uh, he likes 1c5, and uh, we got the Cheeto. He likes 1c5. And the thing is, when you play 1c5, though, you got to be prepared to play Sicilian. So thankfully, both of them play the Sicilian because if e4 right here, we are right back into Sicilian. And when I capture, both of you need to know what to do here because we are, it's actually a response for you that's new in your notes, so you don't get caught up in this. You play nice six after three. So if c3 right here, this is the Smith Mora. Ben messed up his notes. You're supposed to play knight of six to get this position in yours. And he was right for you, though, on c3. You push past, and then you're just going to end up getting back to that, like, dragon structure yeah, that you like. Okay. So most people, when they see this, though, they're going to go d5. And now after e5, this is a lot like what you play. The difference being, if white goes c4 here, it's probably going to transpose directly back into the check Benoni. Ben Benoni. And if not, they're going to do what I did with knight c3. And we need to look at this more because um, these lines are very, very easy for white to play. And if you try to use the exact same ideas that you do in the check, you may run into some issues. He plays d6, I go e4, and notice I've saved a move with c4, and I have an extra idea here. I was already very happy to see black go g6. So now bishop b5 check. And one of the key ideas in this position that you need to be aware of if you're playing this with black is that we're playing for f5 and an all-out attack on probably where white's king's going to be later. So the light square bishop is essential in king's indians and these lock type structures for the potential attack in the future. You don't want to typically play bishop d7 for this reason. So then the next move is a solid prophylactic move. I go a4. And I mean, it's a very Karpovian move because think about the two natural breaks that black has in the position, f5 or b5. So I'm already playing against the b5 break. So a common theme here is if they go a6, I'll capture on d7 and then play a5. So that way, I basically guaranteed to cripple the pawn structure in the long term. So we see that, understand that. So basically, you just got to sit here. Knight d7 would have been much better. And this is just a common theme that people will mess up. So bishop g7, I just do my stuff on the other side of the board. And then as soon as he plays the next move, I'm like, uh, that doesn't feel right. So where to develop the knight here? I'm not quite sure. But knight f6 probably felt more accurate to me because you then play knight h5. 
On knight e7, aggressive players with white should go, well, what's the difference between knight f6 and knight e7? Knight e7 is more double-edged because black can play f5 faster. But also, it gives white the opportunity to attack because the knight is not covering the h5 square. So I can be more aggressive as well. And I felt like my opponent reacted very, very badly here with his next move. So say, what were you thinking though? Like legitimately, what, what move were you thinking? So what, how many different ways do we have to solve this problem for black? Because I'm threatening h5, right? So what's the best option versus what are all the options? Playing h5 yourself is one option. What's another option? Castling, Castling and allowing h5. Okay. Give me another one. You got one? Uh, I take your king if bishop g4. <laughs> f5 immediately is definitely sketchy because I have knight g5, and then when I drop into e6, that's going to be pain town. So both of you are missing a key defensive idea, which is very important to understand. You simply want to play h6 because if h5, I just work past you and your h-pawn defends me, and now f5 is even stronger because you'll be able to hit key squares. Make sense? So when I played h4, my opponent had a knee-jerk reaction here. He's like, oh crap, h5, so I better play h5 myself. But h6 is the much stronger move, mostly because the black king hasn't committed himself to the king side yet, and you have that flexible idea. So that's an important motif to be aware of. So then I just sink on the g5 square. And I mean, n notice and compare all the minor pieces. White's, White's minor pieces are just working black. So he castles into it. I'm like, all right, well, maybe I want to play bishop h6 at some point. I don't know. But then the idea I've been waiting on for a while, a6 happens. So then I'm like, all right, clip, clip, a5, your pawn structure sucks. Also, ideas that I have here... I could eventually move the queen, and this knight could travel from d2 to c4, and that's very annoying touching on those squares. So positionally, white has a lot of things going for him, but at the same time, I'm not quite sure what black's going to do. So black plays on the only side of the board that he seems to have some power over, the king side, so he tickles the b. And here's a, an interesting moment, because bishop h6 is probably pretty good, but compare the bishops. Yeah, just bishop e3, keep the tension in the position. He doesn't have much of an option here. He's got to play for one of the natural breaks, so he plays f5. And now I got pretty critical. I'm like, all right, I would love to play knight g5 and then knight e6 because that's just fun. But after knight g5, f4 seals in the flavor of the bishop. He's not going anywhere. So first, bishop h6. And this stutter step, going bishop e3 and then bishop h6 later, open up the g5 square for my knight. And because both of his f and h pawns have moved forward, the g5 square is this just like, is, is juicy. We're going to use the word juicy there. It's too good. He goes f4 to try to shut things down, and it's too little too late because simple calculation shows that black's going to have material loss here. Grab, grab, and after knight g5, the threat is even stronger with the royal fork being threatened. So the best the best he has is rook f6 to sack the rook. And here, like upon analysis, so I basically played my first like 18 moves of the game with theory, common sense, and only a little bit of accuracy in these last few moves. So I played very, very high-level chess. This is where I started to err, because at this point, I relaxed. I know I'm completely winning, and it's a three-minute game, and I'm just trying to play faster. So here, it's critical. And I mean, looking at this position, for some reason, I was like, all right, I'm pretty sure my king should castle on the king side. I know I want to go after this weakness because it breaks his entire chain if I can capture there. So I played rook d1, but when I analyzed the game with the engine after the fact, castle's queen side was strongest, and I 
compared these two moves like in a split second, and I was like, well, he could play queen takes a5 and maybe attack me. And just like that thought, I went, all right, I'll just play rook d1 and castle. But after castle's queen side, if queen takes a5, too many things are being hit. So he's got to defend the knight. And after e7, the in-between move, knight b1, holds everything together. And this is just completely over. So I could have won the game a lot faster if I was more critical. But rook d1, he captures. And there, there's really no surviving for black here. His, his structure is just completely falling apart. Knight d4, check. Don't be in such a hurry to trade queens just because you have that mentality of, you know, trade down in a winning position. It's the best move. And I'm going to be able to force the trade relatively soon. So king h7. Well, I get my king safe. And here, I mean, I think the engine said white's at like plus four or something just stupid. This is just completely rolling. But my opponent played knight e to c6, tickle tickle on the queen, and just gives me the f-pawn for free. Um, definitely much stronger is the practical move playing f3 because I just castled. The best you have is trying to mess up my structure and get my king out in the open. So that would have been much better, especially because it's a blitz game. Knight e to c6, I take on f4, and I mean my c3 knight's just such, such a good piece. There is no knight e2 check, his knights don't coordinate, his rook on a8 is never getting into the game, and his queen's still on its starting square. Like, I haven't had to really do anything to win this game versus a very strong opponent. His chess.com's rating is 2437. So queen e7, and I mean, uh, this was a, another move that I was pleased with because it was the best move in the position according to the engine, queen g5, just saying, you know, let's get the ladies off the board, and if we don't, I'm probably going to take your c5 pawn or something. He goes queen e6, and after I played f4, um, he resigned because it's pretty clear that his king is not going to be safe, and the crash through is imminent. GG. There's no counterplay, and the connected knights are pretty worthless in this position. So I, I thought this line w was was interesting overall, and I mean I was actually looking at similar positions and explaining motifs when I was working on your chessable repertoire yesterday. Um, but uh, I. You know, I dabble in a lot of openings. Uh, I typically fall under a queen pawn system player because I'm either playing English ready or 1d4 with, with my personal repertoire. Uh, I rarely play 1e4. Um, if you want to see why, look up my game that I had in the pro league with Grandmaster Ramirez where I like lost out of the opening from a very simple opening trap. It's hard to remember everything. I'm not a chess professional. I'm a chess teacher. So uh, stick with what you're good at, <laughs> which is... Uh, not blundering yet. Yeah, stay in your lane. That's right, Ben from the Benoni. I said that today, yeah, stay in your lane. It's an important concept to stay in your lane. All right, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it.